Hi, I'm Dave. I spent 25 years in federal law enforcement in enforcing uh, federal natural resource environmental laws. So I did 10 years as a uniformed officer with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the National Park Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. They were all with Department of Interior. And then my last uh, 15 years was with NOAA, National Marine Fishery Service, Department of Commerce as a special agent, a criminal investigator. So uh, I was a seasonal in Rhode Island in Connecticut. I put in through, um, I put in for a job, OPM job fair. If I didn't have federal status, the OPM job fair allowed me to put in for federal jobs. They would just, every once in a while, they would open up a position to all sources. And so I put in for it. It was at the DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge on the Iowa-Nebraska border, uh, just north of Omaha and Council Bluffs. So it's about 8,000 acres, give or take. Um, the Missouri River runs through the middle of it. Now, before I got there, this had been a very intense law enforcement refuge. There had been jet skiing, water skiing, speed boats. I think even, you know, the fast drag boats that, that were allowed out there. There was a beach where there were parties and drinking. There was a lot of arrest, craziness, um, gang members coming up from Omaha that would go there, fights, riots. I mean, 4th of July at DeSoto was like, it was a wild place. That stopped probably within just a few years, maybe two years, I don't know, uh, before me getting there. So the intensity of the law enforcement that was occurring there, well, it evaporated. And you throw on top of that is that DeSoto Lake, 750 acres, I think, this Oxbow Lake, is silting in. And the fishing there's it's marginal. And it wasn't very good then, and I imagine it's gotten worse that that because there's no flow anymore, because it's been cut off from the main stem Missouri, it's just a muddy bottom. Catfish, uh, buffalo, carp probably are the predominant species by now. So I, I get there. Now I have an expectation of what federal game wardens about. As a refuge officer in Rhode Island to integrate, we were allowed to be gun-ho, and that's all we did was law enforcement. We did in some resource management stuff, but that was pretty much it. I'd worked with, as an intern, uh, working with West Virginia's Department of Natural Resource Conservation Officers, so I'm like, I know what they do. This must be similar. And it was a rude awakening for me. Well, first of all, I was a GS567 position, 1802 refuge officer. And as a refuge officer, there weren't too many in the United States at that time, full-time law enforcement. So there may have been a dozen in the whole country. Parker River, Chicoteque, um, Several down in Florida, like Canaveral, Merritt Island, um, Lockahatchee, Florida Panther, uh, Georgia Head. I'm trying to think, Okie maybe in Savannah. There was some Yazoo in Mississippi. Um, down in Louisiana, there was a few. In the Midwest, it was Minnesota Valley had one. DeSoto... National Wildlife Refuge had two full-time law enforcement only, and then you had Wichita Mountains and then um, San Francisco Bay. So, and there's probably a few others here and there, but very few. And then there was another 300 collateral duty officers that were biologists or managers that also carried a badge and gun. So, full-time law enforcement was very rare on a National Wildlife Refuge. So, just as I get there, they actually had a good poaching case. Kind of interesting one. I wasn't involved in it. This is a aerial picture of DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge. And so what's unique is this is Nebraska, and this is Iowa, but this is Nebraska on the Iowa side. Just like right in here, there's this little, you can see the line that curves down, a little bit of Iowa over on Nebraska. Why is this? Well, the river bends, meanders, and then it gets channelized, and they channelize it here. 
and they cut off this section of Nebraska from Nebraska. It's now an island within Iowa, just like this little piece. So some locals from Blair had gone in here to hunt illegally, and they went into this little section of Iowa. They probably didn't know it, but they were poaching on the refuge, so that's really irrelevant. Shot a deer, drag it off this little piece, and now you have a Lacey Act violation. But when I talk about DeSoto Lake, this is the lake here. 750 acres, it's like a horseshoe, and the fishing wasn't very good. And so that means not a whole lot of people go there. What kind of people go to DeSoto Bend National Wildlife Refuge? Well, you have fishermen in the summer, but the fishing is very slow. And then in the fall, we would get 500,000 snow geese, which is an amazing thing to see. It sounds like a jet plane taking off. They just, the sky is filled with these white, you know, snow geese. But that was like in the fall. One of your main jobs, my job was to direct traffic, putting on a blaze orange vest. I had a patrol car, and there was a patrol truck, but I usually got stuck with the 1968 Ford Fairlane station wagon. And uh, directing traffic, yeah, you can park here. No, no more traffic. You go down to the next parking lot. We parked cars. And, and thousands of people would show up to see the snow geese. They'd go to the visitor center, and then they'd drive around real slow trying to find a place to, to park. And the geese would all... And people would be up there taking pictures. It was it was interesting, but did you need law enforcement to park cars in parking lots? No, but that's what we were used for. The manager had his mindset on what our job was. And um, I, I didn't see eye to eye with him on many things. So in the fall, instead, you know, you'd be out there waiting for cars. Okay, now this lot's closed. You have to go to the next parking lot. You could hear people sky busting because the geese would fly around the refuge. And off refuge, we could go off refuge to enforce MBTA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, but on a Saturday and a Sunday, we parked cars. And you could hear gunshots everywhere. And I, it was very frustrating. I wanted to do game warden work. I didn't want to park cars. Other duties, you know, was um, cleaning garbage. Literally put an orange vest on a stick with a nail, and we were forced to go up and down. There was a section of highway that went past the refuge and had a bag around our shoulder, and we'd clean up tin cans, pop cans and beer cans off the highway and garbage and put in trash bags. And that was one of our duties, which we don't have to do that now. If you're a refuge law enforcement officer now, please remember that there were people that were before you and they struggled, and they had to fight so that you, a long time later, would have a better job. So, um, while I was there, they sent me to Fletzy 9PT-206. And uh, it was a basic police for land management. And then I had to return again to go to um, Rob's Refuge Officer Basic School where you learned about the uh, waterfowl wing, like a wing ding, bags and bags of duck wings that you had to identify. And then you, know, you learned about the Endangered Species Act, Lacey Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act. You know, scenarios of what you might face in the field. One of the things that I, I realized is you wear this patch that says U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And I went over this in my other video with Integrate. You know, they instill in you, you're a federal game warden, you know. We're a United States game warden, federal game warden. No, you're not. Most, there may be some exceptions, but many refuges, you're more of a park ranger type position and visitor services. And that's what it was then. Um, I couldn't just say, I'm, I'm going to go out and check some hunters. I'm not going to park cars. No, I had to park cars, wear my orange vest, direct traffic. A lot of cars were coming, and um, that was my job in the fall. Very rarely did I actually go out and check hunters hunting ducks and geese. So, 
in the summertime, there was a lot of fishing activity. Um, but it was mostly bullheads, just not a lot of game fish being caught. And uh, But I wrote a lot of tickets for fishing without a license. And I got pretty good at that. You know, I think I wrote, if I was there, almost 100 fishing without a license tickets. But it was kind of interesting. Didn't see many drugs, um, not many warrants. It was, it was just very slow, like people from the inner city fishing. But most of them, they were not the real hardcore people that had previously gone to that refuge. You get some boating violations, some trailers that were unregistered. Um, it was very rare that you had undersized fish, game fish. It was mostly trash fish that people were catching. But one of the worst things was there's a visitor center. It's a beautiful visitor center. It has artifacts from a steamboat ship that sunk in what is now the lake, but that was part of the river, the Bertrand. Thousands of artifacts. It's, if you ever get a chance, it's worth seeing. In the Climate Control Museum, you walk in, thousands of shovels and jars of fruits and vegetables and, and um, just dishes and everything that was heading up to Montana, to the gold fields, was on the steamboat. When it hit a snag, it sunk, and then it... Mud came in and covered it up, the bottom part. They took the top part off, but the bottom was completely covered in mud. Somebody in the 60s um, dug it up thinking there might be gold or some sort of other mercury or some other wealth on it, and there wasn't. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife kept all these artifacts, and it has this big museum filled with thousands of artifacts. This museum has an alarm system, and back then, it every night in the summertime, you know, if there was a thunderstorm, uh, glitches in electricity, you know, in the summer a lot, the alarm went off two or three times a night. And you'd have to get up, put all your gear in. I lived on the refuge. I had to walk across and get in the truck, drive them half a mile to the visitor center, go in there in the museum, turn the alarm off, do a search of the building. And uh, it just got old. And it was just over night after night after night. And, uh, you know, trying to go on trips to stay away for a couple of days, you know, take a, a small vacation to get away from the place was something you just had to do to get sleep. And I made the mistake, you know, I came in late one day, two or three hours late. And it's like, you know, we'll call it even. I worked three hours last night. I'll come in three hours late. They were like, oh. You know, that's leave without, you know, <coughs> authorization. Um, you know, AWOL, absent without leave. You didn't get permission to do that. Never did it again. But it was it was hard for me being a brand new officer, trying to all these federal policies and procedures, a lot of them. And to me, it was just like I had to do lots of paperwork. So but I finally got it. OK, I worked three hours, I'd call the boss, I'm tired, I was up three hours, the alarm went off multiple times last night, I didn't get sleep, I'm asking, and I'd call him up at like 6.30 in the morning on Saturday or Sunday, and I'd wake him up, I said, you told me to call you and ask permission, so I'm calling you, all right, all right, go ahead, and just have your radio nearby in case there's an emergency, I said, otherwise, I'm going to request overtime, oh, you, you can't do that, well, mm. It is. It's overtime. If I work a full eight-hour day and I have to come back, okay? But it was a pain in the butt dealing with the alarm system. I got to do some um, interesting things. Actually, one interesting story was there were researchers that did research out on the refuge. One had um, was doing research on deer, telemetry work. So they, I'd go out and ride with them on the refuge. On a slow day, I had learned how to put, you know, listening, and it was like a TV antenna on top of the pickup truck, and you turn it, and you triangulation the deer. It was interesting to me, and I got into helping them put radio collars on the deer. But one day, I actually had an, an incident where the um, they're only doing that to does. 
and it was dealing with their feeding range. Well, they got a, a big eight-point buck. This deer had to be, I, I'm guessing, a white tail. He was pushing probably 130, 140 pounds. Probably as big or bigger than me. And so they didn't want bucks put radio collars on bucks, so they were, they'd open the gate of this netted enclosure and let them loose. Well, on this one, the buck got his antlers all wrapped up in the rope. So the biologist researcher said, okay, hold it down as much as you can. I'm going to cut that loose and you just push him aside. He cuts the rope, and I tried to push the, the buck away, and said he came back, and he starts ramming me up against this big cottonwood tree, just throwing me out, and I'm getting gored, really. Pushed up, I mean, lifting me off the ground. And uh, it finally ran off, but I had my bulletproof vest on, but it had little divots in the Kevlar, and um, I had a porcelain plate in the middle, so it didn't go through that, but it in the Kevlar part it had little divots on it. If I hadn't been wearing that, I probably would have had a broken rib cage or or worse. We also had commercial fishermen that would come in to take the junk fish out. They lay out gill nets for um, buffalo and carp, so I'd go out with them to make sure they weren't catching game fish. And uh, I enjoyed going out on the boat with them. These, some of these guys were hardcore, old-time poachers. And they were just like, you know, one guy named Jesse James. I'm sure he's passed on since now. Big guy, and he used to, I mean, hardcore poaching from the 50s and the 60s and 70s on up. And uh, But he, he goes, let me teach you a few things so you can go out there and get the people that did I, what I did. And so I learned things, you know. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Did I trust him? No, but... He was willing to talk to me about how he used to poach. I was willing to, to listen, to learn. Um, the refuge itself, well, we had mushroom hunters. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, this part here is Nebraska. But all this above is Iowa. And uh, so much of this middle section was closed off. But there were a lot of morale mushrooms in there. And uh, we had people from Omaha that would come up, commercial mushroom hunters, that would just get, go into closed areas and get bags and bags of these morales, very tasty mushroom. And so, and they'd run from you. So, you know, I remember one time parked down the road, off the road a little way, seeing a van driving slow, comes to a stop, a closed area, guy runs out with just big giant, you know, 50 get on um, trash bags filled with morales. So I put the put the lights on and I go to pull them over, and they run from me. It's, now back then there were no no really rules or policies on high speed chase, especially for like mushroom hunter. You wouldn't do it today, but back then it was like sure. So you know you're doing spinning out and shooting gravel everywhere and going after this van that's running from you that's got several thousand dollars worth of morale mushrooms. And uh, maintenance workers were like, hey, we got the road grader out. We'll, we'll close the road off. I'm like, sounds good. You know, $100 ticket or so. Again, I look back on it. Could have killed, you know, bird watchers or a family. It's It wasn't worth it. But again, things were different then. Policies change all the time. And, and you know, but back then you could chase after people. We had a... Uh, black powder hunt, but it was so over-regulated that it just, there was no, just there would be no violations with the black powder or the archery folks, except for that one incident where people came in, and those were archers that snuck into the, the side, so it took a long time to get to this other side of the refuge, because this side here, you'd have to drive, you know, almost an hour or so into Nebraska, Blair, drive south towards Omaha to get to this point so it was hard to get over there and so much of the time you had to be really close to the visitor center because if somebody got locked out of their car they'd call you on the radio you got to come and unlock you know use a slim gym and get somebody unlocked from their car and so you never really went too far because always 
as soon as you would go halfway to the other side of the refuge, you'd get a radio call. We need you at the visitor center. And again, management said that was a priority, so you had to go. And it got to the point where it was just like, it was easier just to drive around the auto loop and wave to people. And so I, I didn't like the job there. I was very lucky to work with one of the special agents out of Omaha, Cleve. Um, he passed away a few years ago. Um, amazing special agent. And uh, we made some good cases. I worked with him down in the Cheyenne Bottoms in Kansas and in Nebraska. And I really enjoyed just, you know, just, it was like a, a road trip. You're going to small town to small town out in the Midwest and looking for places where people were hunting illegally. Um, in Kansas, the game warden said, here's this farm. We can't get too close, but we think they're up to no good. So, um, we had, a, we had somebody drop us off. We're in camos and stuff. We go into a cornfield right up to where there's this pond. And we go there at night or in the morning or so. Five or so in the morning. They come out. They start setting up. And um, for a couple hours, we're watching them. A little binoculars, notebook. And bang, bang, bang. They'd shoot ducks. And then they'd stomp them in the mud in the in the pond there. And so I made notes. Okay, this guy who's got, you know, um, he had like a, a dark green ski cap. He's the one stomping them on that side. And that guy over there, he's got, you know, like University of Kansas hat on. He's stomping them over on this side. And so you're writing these down time and date, you know, you know, 0830, you know, guy in green ski cap did this. So by, they start packing up and getting ready to go, maybe by 10, 30, 11, we walk out of the cornfield, you know, I see a federal game wards, put your guns down, they're like, what? Who are, who the hell are you? And we're showing the badge, and the agent's getting kind of like, put your damn guns on the ground now, you're yelling at them. I've got my hand on my gun, put your guns on the ground. They put it down. They said, hey, we haven't done anything. This is our property. Where's all your ducks? Look, we each got two ducks apiece. That's it. You know, that's all we got. Here's our licenses. And then we would be, Dave, go out into the pond and get the rest of them. And I'd go out, pull one, two, three, four. They were way over limit. And like I said, they shoved them in the mud. So if a game warden showed up, they wouldn't know to look there. And I was able to say, you and the green hat, come here. These are your ducks. And I lay them out. I said, I need to see ID from you, driver's license. This is the other guy. It was a good case. We got quite a few tickets out of that. A couple hundred dollars worth of tickets on these guys for shooting over limits. I helped Cleve on a case. There's a power plant in Blair, Nebraska, where somebody had... Uh, one of the workers at the power plant was from Florida, had moved to Idaho, but lied on, on how long they had been in Idaho, claimed to be an Idaho resident, shot a bear, and then brought the bear back to Florida. Good Lacey Act case. And so I learned some note-taking, interview skills. I got to ask a few questions. This was good. It was like a proving grounds for me to learn a lot of good skills that I would use later. So, let's see, Wilson Island, it's a state park and state uh, wildlife management area. I made a good waterfowl case there. This guy had an over-under, and uh, he had lead shot. He said, well, I'm shooting squirrels, but he had some ducks that he had shot. He goes, well, I'm shooting both ducks and squirrels. And he said, you can't have lead shot um, while shooting ducks. So that went to... Um, a bench trial before U.S. magistrate, and uh, you know, the guy was found guilty. The judge said, "Yeah, you can't you can't have lead shot on you if you're shooting ducks." Uh, back then, the, I don't know if I already said the weapon we carried was the 357 Magnum Smith and Wesson Model 66. We had shotguns, but we didn't have locks gun gun locks on. 
So the seat cushion for the patrol truck had a little slip in it. You could put the shotgun in the slip. And um, it wasn't safe like that. But again, back then, it's what they saw as refuge law enforcement's role was not... They didn't like us being police. Uh, if I went, you know, they would send me to go get mail in Blair, Nebraska, and they would say, take your gun off. I'm like, no, I'm not going to take my gun off. I'm in uniform in a law enforcement vehicle. They said, well, you're not a police officer. You, there's no need for you to have a gun on. I'm a target. Nobody's going to target you there. It's Blair. Everyone likes you in Blair. Uh, just recently, they arrested someone for threatening to kill one of the refuge officers, I believe. And so, you know, I, I again, butt heads with management and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, but if you're going to do it or else we're going to fire you for not following orders. Said, okay, I'm going to take my uniform off. I'll go in civilian clothes in a civilian vehicle, you know, unmarked vehicle, and I'll, I'll get the mail for you. And, they, you know, but it was, back then it said, refuge law enforcement officer position had other duties as assigned, which could be anything. They cleaned outhouses sometimes. Um, like I said, clean garbage and trash. And it was a miserable place when your job was to park cars, respond to alarms, um, unlock cars for people. You know, this was... You were more of a gopher. And... Um, you don't have that today, but you did back then. Some of the other things that was just starting then was conservation easements. So at this time in the early 90s, this is when you got farm aid. Small farms are being, people are, are their loans, they can't pay them, they're losing their small family farms. And so... It was kind of a joint Fish and Wildlife and USDA um, Department of Agriculture program that some of the loans would be forgiven if they agreed that the wetlands on their property would be protected and U.S. Fish and Wildlife would manage the wetland section. And there were certain terms and conditions. And so I was starting to go out with the biologists, probably more of a bodyguard so they could do their assessment of wetlands to make sure that the farmers wouldn't come out and, and pull guns on them because that was starting to happen. These farmers were angry. They were losing their farms and all of a sudden the government comes in and says we're going to take your wetland. Like, you know, if you got a hundred acre farm, we're going to take 20 acres. And that's off limits. You can't farm on it. You can't drain it. You can't do anything on that wetland easement. And uh, they didn't like that. They hated that. And so it was, you know, there was a couple of times we went out and people got kind of a little bit of, they got mouthy, you know, and I was just, biologist, you do your thing. Okay, sir, here's the deal. This is part of the agreement with your, your easement. Um, we have a right to be here, you know. This allows you to keep your property. And you just, you de-escalated it. But our actual law enforcement authority there was kind of, it was kind of sketchy. You know, we had refuge officers could go off refuge for checking duck hunters and, and butterfowl enforcement, Lacey Act. I mean, federal laws. But these easements were, the laws were a little shady. It was based upon an agreement. And, and I don't know all the specifics, but, you know, I just remember they couldn't do anything to that wetland easement. I had another interesting incident that occurred there that it really kind of bumped up our authority a little bit more. Uh, it almost got me in trouble. I got up early one day in the fall and decided to check a um, state wildlife management area that was like two or three miles to the north of the refuge on the Missouri in Iowa. So I go out there checking a few hunters that were coming back. Let me see your birds. And I was getting pretty good. I could pull the wing out. I couldn't tell them in the air. It wasn't that good, but I could just pull the wing out and say, yeah, okay, that's a gadwall. 
you know, Hen Mallard or Black Duck, I could tell the difference. The Speculum, the the purple with the white line would be Mallard. If it's just purple only, it was the Black Duck. But this hunter says, you know, there's a lot of marijuana back there. It's in buckets, it's all over the place. There's 50 plants or so. Okay. Can you show me where that is? But be careful, don't go into where it's at. So he took me up to the and I said, whoa, that's a lot. There's a lot of plants there. So I said, let's get out of here. And I uh, get back to the parking lot where I could get a better radio signal from the truck and called, it's been a while, Harrison County Sheriff's Department. And I said, you know, I'm at one of the wildlife management areas. I've got some dope here, um, quite a bit. Um, do you want me to call it in over the radio or do you want me to, in an hour or so, call on the phone? But... And they said, yeah, we can get a deputy out there. We'll, we'll cut it down right now. Okay, I'm at this specific location. So a deputy comes out, and me and him go in there, and we cut the plants down, load his truck up with all these buckets and stuff. And um, he's like, hey, I appreciate it. Thank you for backing me up and being in there and, and letting us know about this. We appreciate that. So some good work and relationship there. Management was outraged. Not only that, they told... The, all the secretaries and the biologists and the museum curators, everybody knew the refuge manager was upset. You don't do drug enforcement there. And you have no authority to do that. So we're gonna we're gonna discuss it with with the regional office to see if you committed a, a violation of law and if you you know violated policy. But at that time I think it's still in effect now. The Lacey Act, 16 U.S.C., United States Code, had a very interesting little section on it that said, if you're enforcing a federal wildlife law anywhere in the United States, and you come across another federal violation you have jurisdictional authority over that violation. Now, that's written in the Lacey Act. I don't know if they've taken it out or not, but it was at that time. And so the regional office up there, and I believe the regional office was Minneapolis, said, he's okay. He's there to check duck hunters. He's checking duck hunters. He's enforcing, and he's doing it also on a border area between Iowa and Nebraska, so there's potential Lacey Act issues. Matter of fact, just him going to work every day and putting on the uniform, he's enforcing the Lacey Act. He's there for Lacey Act violations. The growing of marijuana is a federal violation of law. He's covered. He has the right, and he's letting the deputy sheriff take a lead. He has a right to be there helping him cut those plants down because that's a federal violation, a federal criminal act. And he absolutely has authority to assist in that matter. They still didn't like it. Okay, they didn't like it. All right, all right, whatever. Don't do it again. Okay. But it it was kind of a unique little thing that happened there. It's like, you know, Lacey Act has a lot of power, a lot of a lot of punch to it. And I would use it many years later when. In other, well, I used it in the Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, mostly as NOAA Special Agent, dealing with a lot of Lacey Act issues with tribal. But it's, it, Lacey Act, I could go on and on about, but it's dealing with either crossing state lines or international borders or special maritime territorial jurisdiction in the United States, which includes national wildlife refuges, national parks. Okay, and, and so there's a lot of little it's very interesting law. Well, read up on it, the Lacey Act. So the last thing was, uh, I did some in the winter. Also did ice fishing. Uh, there was some ice fishing. I'd go out there and, and I was checking, measuring fish, checking licenses. Also, how many hours have you been fishing? How many species have you caught? And I had tally sheets, and I did, you know, fish creel surveys, basically, of the people that were out there ice fishing. 
We had um, wild marijuana, so ditch weed, and I would cut that down sometimes because it was in areas near parking lots, um, but I would just leave it out to, to rot, cut it down with a machete, and it would just rot away. Um, it didn't have the THC content of the marijuana drug, but it looked identical. You wouldn't know the difference between the wild and it was used back in the 1800s in that area, even the early 1900s, for rope and rigging the hemp, the stalks. So there's a lot of it in the Midwest that just grows. They call it ditch weed. And sometimes people will cut it and take it and mix it in with other stuff so the, the good stuff can go a little further. If you mix it with some of the wild stuff, some people won't notice the difference. Um, but the, the last one of the last things I'll talk about was... Um, so the state of Nebraska tries to buy some property to the south of DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge on the Nebraska side, and sellers don't want to sell. It's a, it's a farm. They don't want to sell it, so they seize it, condemn it. And they give them the fair market value after they seize it, but they, they seize and condemn private property. It sucks. I don't like that. So they seize it and condemn it. The state of Nebraska does it. Then they hand it off to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and say, here, you can have this for a National Wildlife Refuge. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife says, okay, we'll take it. And it becomes the Boyer Shoot National Wildlife Refuge, managed by DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge. And it's not marked at the time. There's no boat ramp. So today it's been it's developed, but at that time it wasn't. It had just been taken. And the people that had to have it seized from them, they were an older couple, they left, but their children would come back and hunt on it. They asked me to go down there, tell them, kick them out, tell them. This is federal property now, and you can't hunt and fish on it. It's, you know, totally closed to the public until a management plan can be made up. So I go down there, and it was a standoff. It was like the, the grandkids, you know. And uh, I walk up there, and it was like, it, it was very confrontational. It was I was scared. They're like, F you, you know. Get the hell off our land. This is our land. You stole it. And we're not leaving. We're going to hunt all day. And there's nothing you can do about it. And, you know, they're holding their guns. And I've got my hand on mine. And I'm like, you know what? It's not worth it. At this time, I already put in for the park service. I pretty much already know that I'm going to get the job. Um, I said, you know what? I'm leaving. Look, I'm taking my hand off my gun. Put your gun down. Just put it on the ground, and I will leave. If you, if all of you put your guns on the ground, I'm going to back off, and I'm going to leave. I just want to do it so that I won't get hurt. I'm going to get home tonight, okay? And I walked backwards. They, they did. They put their guns down on the ground. And they're like, get the fuck out of here, you know? I'm leaving, and I leave. That's not the time to act tough when you're outnumbered. You know, it's four or five people to me. No portable radios wouldn't get out anywhere out there. Um, it was it was not a good situation. And I went back and I remember the next day talking to manager. This is what happened. I said they're they're being very hostile. I'm not going back there without backup unless there's two or three officers. I'm not. I just can't do that. I'm not not going to risk my life over this. They said, all right. We're probably not going to send anyone down for a while. We'll let things cool off. But it was um, just the whole thing about how Boyer Shoot was acquired, my personal opinion, was BS. But, and Fish and Wildlife, they absolutely were telling the state of Nebraska, you know, we really like this this little shoot here, uh, Oxbow. You know, wink, wink. It would be great if you could get that. And when they tried to buy it, the people didn't want to sell out. Then the state of Nebraska said, it's ours, condemnation. States can do that. And the states can also say, 
Here you go, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. This will make a nice addition to your National Wildlife Refuge System. And so, um, like I said, it was sometimes a better part of the hours to just, especially over something silly as duck hunting, it's not worth getting killed over. So walk out, hey, I'm not going to touch my gun, put your guns down, everything's going to be cool, I'm going to leave. I'm leaving. But i, I got to keep my eye on this. It's for my safety. You know, things calmed down and I walked away. Um, it was a tough situation. You know, I'm 40 minutes. I'm going to try to wrap this up. Another situation I had for rural officers in the Midwest to be aware of. I went to the boundary, the northwest boundary of the refuge on the Iowa side one day, just checking out some boundary signs. And they were doing some farming. They had some equipment out there along the boundary on the private property. And I remember going, um, checking the fence, and all of a sudden a strong, powerful uh, ammonia smell was hitting me. My eyes were watering up, just tears were coming out, and it just felt like my eyes were burning. And then it was like, I started like, and it's just like, I have to get the hell out of here. And I remember just running as fast as I could back in the truck, you know, keeping my head down low. It just seemed like at a certain level it was really bad. And just hauling ass out of there, you know. And uh, what it appears to have been, it may have been that anhydrous ammonia stuff that they would put on crops. And like a fertilizer, some kind of not familiar with agricultural practices in Iowa. But I do know it was the, that anhydrous ammonia is a very toxic thing. It killed all those people in Bhopal, India. And it's a fertilizer of some kind. But I remember just the, the wind must have blown and shifted. And from that private property, it blew over. And uh, it's it was scary. Because that stuff can mess you up. And so be cognizant of, if you're a deputy or a game warden or you work at the refuge, ask questions about farming practices. Is there stuff out there they put on the fields that can harm me? Ask your biologist out there. It's really important to know this, this kind of stuff. But... Um, and I did some boat patrol. I just wanted to touch briefly on that. Um, so they had a little boathouse. You pull up the gate. And it had a little track. And it was uh, electric. And it would pull the boat down into the water. Um, so I'd go out there. Again, checking some of the boats. Bass boats out there. Checking fishing licenses. Boating registration. PFDs. And I think I wrote some tickets. People didn't have life preservers on them. You know, but um, it was... Again, you'd be out on the lake, and then it was like, you know, R5, can you come back to the visitor center? We have a family that's locked out of their car. All right, I'm on the boat. I'm going to have to put the boat away. It's going to take me, you know, 30 minutes. And if that was your priority. I eventually, you know, left there and went to the National Park Service. Being a refuge officer at DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge in the early 90s, it sucked. Okay? We were, we carried badges and guns, but we really weren't federal game wardens. We were more of a, like an urban park ranger, public service type person. Hi, what can I do to make your stay better? And, uh, you know, every night when you closed, you had to close the gates, make sure of spotlights. Everyone was out of the parking lots and do the big sweep through the entire refuge, get everybody out, lock the gates. And then if somebody was still in there, or if a boat was still in there after hours, then you'd have to go and search for this boat. And it was the closing procedures. Every night was the same thing. There was always one or two people that would... And then there was a state park, Wilson Island. So people would try to go through the refuge to get to the park. Otherwise, it would long the way around on dirt roads. So they would go around the closed gate and try to get there. But you've already locked that far gate down. And so then they get stuck, and then they'd be like, you know, they'd have to walk to the payphone at Wilson Island State Park and say, hey, we're locked in the refuge. Because you know, if you missed them, it would be easy to do. You lock the gate, you're going around, clearing everything out, not see a car going around. Look, 
I know things changed, but it took a long time. It's my understanding, refuge law enforcement on, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't really become like 1801s going up to GS9, 11s until like 2010. Okay, 2010. And I'm in 1992 and 93 dealing with this crap. So that's, that's 20 years. It took 20 years for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to become, and they still got problems, to become even somewhat, with six, they, now they have 6C retirement. We had none of that. Matter of fact, when they talked about trying to turn us into a professionalized law enforcement program, the manager said, if they do that, I'm going to make you a biotech, biological technician with collateral duties as law enforcement. I can get away with it. You won't get your 6C retirement. Yeah, you'll, you'll, and you'll do whatever I say, and you'll clean the roads and the garbage and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I think the Park Service, why? And it, it broke my heart because I that's what I really loved doing. The job could have been really cool if we'd been allowed to be actual really game wardens instead of these, you know, park attendants really is what we were. Um, other One last thing too was the... Uh, the fee system that had started, so we would do roadblocks to make sure people were paying their their fees. Um, again, things have changed, and I'm sure it's different there now, but in the early 90s, it was a very good place to work. And uh, there was me and another refuge officer. That refuge officer went to the Park Service. I went to the Park Service. And within a year... Year and a half, I was a GS9 with 6C retirement, my 20 year retirement. And Park Service, I got a 12 gauge and AR 15, 6 hour semi automatic, 9 millimeter, P228. I mean, just a very different program in the Park Service, more aggressive law enforcement program. And Fish and Wildlife would struggle, like I said, for almost 20 years until they finally started coming up with zone officers. And, and you know, things were different back then. And, uh, but it was a start. It started my career off, you know. So my, my time at DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge, it wasn't the best. Um, oh, and one other interesting thing, I know I keep saying that was, uh, so I got called, Cleve was on vacation, and there's a call that someone's flying into Sioux City, and they've got some sort of monkey with them, jungle monkey. They were a military personnel from Panama and they decided to make a pet out of this this creature that was kind of like a monkey with big giant eyes and um, so they sent me up to Sioux City to get the information off the guy I had a little carrier I put the animal in it sees the animal here's an evidence tag and then I had to drive all the way back down to Omaha to the Henry Henry Dorley Zoo where they, the, the little monkey would live the rest of his life in their rain, tropical rainforest exhibit. But while I was there, um, I could see in another room these ferrets with the little black eyes. I said, is that black-footed ferrets? And they let me put on like a little, like a hazmat suit. And they said, you want to see an officer? And they, they took me back there. I could only see it from a distance. I couldn't get real close, but I had, he had to put on a suit and everything. But here I am in the same room of, as an endangered black-footed ferrets that were going to be sent to Wyoming to the Shirley Basin is where they were going to be releasing these. And they had a um, captive breeding program there. Now black-footed ferrets are doing, you know, actually pretty good, I understand, in Wyoming. But that was kind of a real thrill to get to see that. But overall, I, I didn't care. You know, Iowa's pretty. Nebraska, I love Nebraska. It, it, it's an interesting area, and I enjoyed going out with the special agent and just going cruising around from town to town looking for duck hunters and it was fun it, but being on the refuge sucked and uh, you know there were many other refuges I wish I could have gone to but I had to get out I was butting heads with management and off to the park service I went and that's another story anyway thank you for listening to me and um like I said, I'm doing multiple videos on my career. Um, so, thank you. Have a good night.